Hey friends, it's Matt Knutson, and you're listening to the Matt Ballerker Podcast. Good day, fine people out there. Thank you once again for tuning in to the Matt Balaker podcast. To earn extra points, please hit like, subscribe, and share. You don't have to slam the subscribe button. You can gently click it like a gentle person. Uh, you guys, I love you. And as evidence of my love, we have an amazing guest. It's a gentleman I've known for quite some time, but now we're going to share his story. He's Hawaiian born and Midwest raised. He had impressive blonde locks as a young and re real, real handsome hair. He's a former merchant marine and a current stand up, and he stars on the hit show Shrinking. Please welcome Matt Knutson to the program. How are you doing, hey. Matt? Matty Ball came. I'm doing fantastic. A pleasure does not begin to cover it. It does. I, that's that's what I'm feeling about having you on. <laughs> and and there, there's a lot to unpack, but. We got to start with hair because obviously you, you have really good looking hair now. Thank but you. You posted a photo not long ago. It looked like one of the Nelson brothers. From the <laughs> I mean, like, bear with us. What, what's the longest your hair has been, Matt? Oh, I would have to say um, maybe like mid chest and all the way into the back. It was all the same length that I just, it was back in your 20s, you know, back when you know it all, you and know. The the longest I I had shoulder length hair and, and I worked hard to get that, but mm. it, it was a pain in the ass to maintain. What what was your secret to you know going beyond shoulder man? <laughs> just what happened was I just didn't cut it. Ah. And I didn't really care how it looked. Not that I was like, you know, that 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 vain about it, but it was just like, I mean, I remember um like very vividly backpacking around Europe and I didn't have like any money. And so I was trying to save money and I was like uh, at the hostel you could either buy a shower token uh, but I was just like I just washed my hair in the sink yeah. and I remember it like washing it down the, the, the drain and it got stuck. And I was like, Oh man. So instead of trying to like manage it or anything, I just grabbed it all and just yanked it. You just grab it all and yanked it. Like I just yanked it. <laughs> I, I remember like I, I, I was really into Alice in Chains and ministry back in the day. Like I, mm. I, I thought it'd be like so cool to look like Al Jorgensen, but I could never get the dreads. Like, were you emulating like a, a, a music star? For, you're just. No, I mean, I play music, but I wasn't trying to, you know, Greg Allman it up. It was just, <laughs> that's what you look like when you just don't cut your hair. I, I, I had to be honest, I've never given it that much like a uh, thought. But, um, you know, when I first got to L.A., I, uh, one of the first acting jobs I got was as Jesus Christ on Malcolm in the Middle. And I didn't have to I didn't have to wear a wig or put on a fake beard. That's how I looked. They just had me go to a beauty salon and have it all dyed brown. It did Jesus it up a little bit. So that that's a that's <laughs> impressive. So you moved to L.A. and your first gig is as Jesus. Well, it was my second gig. Like, it's my second TV gig. The first job I ever did was a, on a show called Citizen Baines with uh, James Cromwell and M. Beth Davids. And I was like the mailroom guy, just like, you know, pushing around and like, you know, delivering mail at this law firm that M. Beth Davids owned. And James Cromwell's character used to be like a senator or something like that, but okay. he lost his election. So he just had to go back into like the real world or something. And he got a job at his daughter's law firm. So it was Citizen Baines instead I, I of Senator that. Baines. Citizen, you know, get back to the real world, Senator. But uh, so you, obviously you ended up in LA, you've done wonderful things. But you didn't Thanks, start Maddie. there. You, you were you were born in an island paradise, and then, <laughs> and then left for the Midwest. What's right. the deal there, Matt? 
Well, you know, when you're growing up, uh, you don't have independent wealth. So like whatever your parents say, like, hey, we're moving. And you're like four. You're like, whoa, hold on. I've I'm got roots here, mom I've and dad. <laughs> I've made some some great friends in pre-K. Mm-hmm. We're not going anywhere. Um, but my dad, when I was growing up and pretty much my whole life, he was a, a pastor oh. and he would just work at a church for a certain amount of time or you know he would just move on to something else and when you're a kid you just you you pack it up and you say goodbye you go with it you pack it up you say goodbye but that's how you have a worldly upbringing so where you you mentioned midwest raised where in the midwest uh, well we moved from we moved from um from Hawaii to Colorado to Nebraska to Iowa to North Dakota. And my family moved from North Dakota to Southern California. That's where I finished high school. Wow. In okay, Costa so, Mesa. So you really rocked it, as a lot of people in California <laughs> call the flyover states. Um, <laughs> it's true. But, you know, Nebraska, Colorado. In fact, we've had, we've had a lot of Nebraska love on the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, North Dakota. What are some of the... Um, I guess primary memories you have from those places, like what, what what sticks out? You know, when I think about North Dakota, it was a small farming community. I think the town was about 1200, maybe 1300. And it was cold. And it was, I remember they plowed the streets and we would make forts in the snow and I remember like digging through like a, a giant snow bank and seeing the street sign that was on the corner, which means that would, that snow drift was probably eight feet high, 10 feet high. So if you're seeing the street sign in a snow bank, that, that, that's pretty cold. And also um, just growing up and you have not a lot of cares, responsibilities. So it was pretty, pretty footloose and fancy free. Like, did you have the expectation of we will be leaving in a few years or did you always think the next move would be the last? I had no expectation. I didn't think about it. I didn't like it. I do remember when we moved to California, I was like, I didn't want to do it. I like, I had friends and I, I wanted to stay put, but I think in retrospect, it worked out better because when I did get out of school, I kind of had a, a central base here in California mm-hmm. where I can actually, I live here in Santa Monica and I can visit my family who live close and it doesn't involve airfare, uh, you know, travel, all these other things that so many people who come to Los Angeles have to uh, f- factor into their lives. And that right. is really they, a factor. They get homesick, or it's it's a major expense, and it, yeah. And most people, especially if you come out to LA for acting, you're not raking in the big bucks immediately. So the idea of flying cross country is probably not in the cards. Yeah. Also, like anytime the holiday a holiday comes up, like uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas or anything like that, you're just like, well, I'm not going to go to you know to Fiji. I'm going to go back to Saginaw, Michigan and visit my family. Saginaw, Michigan. That's a common choice we have to make. True, 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 true. So it's a lot less, um, a, a lot less factors. I, I still go down and I'll, I'll drive down and have lunch with my mom like once a month just because well, I can. Well, cause, and because you're a good son. Because I'm a great guy. My, my mom is, 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 is from the Midwest. My wife's family is. And therefore, I, I'm an expert in all things Midwest. I believe, Matt Knudsen, that people are more friendly uh, in the Midwest. True or false? What, what do you, what's your take? Um, I think you are the recipient of the energy that you put out into the universe. So I could go down the street and start up a conversation with anyone tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And I would, I would have, I would have no trouble because I'm a people person, you know? And if you have this jaded kind of dark energy, like everyone sucks, mm-hmm. you know, if you're going to go to, you know, Cleveland, Ohio with everyone sucks, everyone there is going to suck. You bring yourself wherever you go, as they wherever, say. Yeah. <laughs> wherever you go, there you are. Well, I, no, I, I think that you are the energy you put out in this world. I think 
very, very wise words. Um, but your energy is always, you know, very, very positive, very fun. Um, Thanks. That's not always the case with with actors. You know, I mean, I, that's not always the case with people. But I, I, I think um, one, it's always been it, it, it's been a joy to work with you when we have because you've always treated people well. And I, and I, it's God's honest truth, people out there. But um, what is it? Uh, was it about performing, uh, whether it's acting or comedy? You know, what is it that attracted you to it? That's a great question. I. I <sighs> I had always just kind of had that kind of uh, performance desire. And, you know, I'm sure you've heard Class Clown five billion times on your show, but I had, uh, um, you know, the ability to just kind of find the funny thing and say it and and engage people. And, um, you know, there's, there's IQ and EQ, you know, mm -hmm. intelligence versus emotional. Uh, with all humility, I've always had kind of a high EQ and I, I can lean in and kind of engage people in a way that lifts us all up and makes us feel better. So it it helps to bring bring a little spark to somebody's day and you get to enjoy it, too. You know, yeah, it, it, it helps you. And it, it, it's like a show I watch. Sometimes, you know, you 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 help yourself by helping others. We'll we'll talk about that. But right. I was at I was at I did a show uh, Monday night at the comedy store, in the main room at the comedy store. I brought up David Spade and I it was really a great, great moment for me. I had a wonderful time. The crowd was fantastic. And there was hundreds of people in there that I didn't know, but we were all sharing a laugh. And I felt very responsible for that laugh because it was, you know, we were doing it all together. And um, uh, it was, it you was the, the conductor of the comedy orchestra. Yeah, I, I feel like like the best shows are kind of town halls mm -hmm. where we're all, hey, we're all being heard and we're all kind of, you know, I'll, I'll do most of the talking, but, um, yeah. you know, I there's mean, a connection. Uh, what it is a stand-up comedy is a conversation with the audience where you're the only one talking <laughs> right. and, and that doesn't mean the audience can't respond but you when prompted audience when prompted right. very, very important right 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 so b before you became a star of stand-up and, and the screen star. you were you guys didn't you, see it he was air quoting with his finger uh, no no I, my, my hands are, are um, I was air quoting with his fingers. Fair, fair enough. But you were a merchant marine. True. What is that? Merchant marines, the most concise uh, uh, way I've heard it put is the truckers of the sea. <laughs> you know, you, you transport cargo all over the world. Uh, you're not enlisted. You're not in the military. You don't have to, uh, you know, commit to four years or whatever. All of your um, accreditation is through the Coast Guard, okay. but it's a union job. I was a member of the Seafarers International Union, and you can just go. It's a job by job by job basis. So you go and you go to the hiring hall and you get it. You get a ship and you take it. You know, you take it wherever it's headed but you're not committed in the same way as someone who's going to Afghanistan for two years, whether they like it or not. So can we thank you for your service, Matt? No. no. Okay. In Fair. fact, um, uh, actually enlisted people don't like merchant Marines, merchant oh. seamen. They don't like them because of the flexibility and they actually can make good money. And you're not shot at as much, I, I would hope. <laughs> no, I would hope. No, uh, although I did uh, serve in areas where they were, you know, uh, it was pretty pretty dicey. I went over to uh, Mogadishu, Somalia during Operation Restore Hope. I had put on like a flak jacket and a helmet to go tie the, the ship to the dock. It was, wow. it was pretty hairy. It was pretty hairy. Did you have to deal with pirates? Yes, in that area, there's uh, there's yeah, a lot what, what of like, is a piracy. Twenty first century pirate, like what? Sometimes they will try and you know bring weapons and go onto the bridge. I would say the most part, it's um, theft of cargo. Okay. You know, so there was a lot of that, like in in Africa. I went to uh, the Far East, like coming through China, and they would 
break into containers and steal film and steal electronics and you know what I mean? Like quick stuff that they could, they, they could get away with. I don't think they have the stones to bring a gun up and, you know, Captain Phillips it right. these days. I mean, maybe they do, but it's a, the risk reward the is. Risk, no, well, it, I mean, it's kind of heartening to know that it's not just IP they steal in China. It's also like <laughs> the old school stuff. So I you, honestly, oh, I'm sorry, Matt, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I had an audition to read for the movie Captain Phillips. Oh. And I think a large part of it was because I was a merchant marine and now an actor. So the the cross section of those people, it was so small. You know, I, I really it was one of those ones like the first 10 minutes of the meeting was like, so merchant marine, huh? And I told him all my sea stories. And that, that's great. Then I read the scene. It was to be one of the crew members with Tom Hanks. Oh, wow. And I was one of those. It was one of those ones where I was like, I'm going to work with Paul Greengrass. I'm going to be in this thing. You know, you like checking your phone and it never happened, but I, it, it couldn't have gone better. It could have, well, do? I mean, if you're going to make a Venn diagram, there's probably a really large circle with actors and a much smaller one of merchant Marines. And if you superimpose the two, you have Matt Knudsen. So you have this job <laughs> as trucker of the sea. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to faraway places. You have stability, decent pay. And then you stop to become an actor. What yes. the hell were you thinking? Well, I knew I didn't want to be a sailor my whole life. But those years, I always say, were the years I would have gone to college. I never went to college. I was at high school. I finished high school. And, and then that was kind of it for me. But I did want to act. I did want to do stand-up. So mm -hmm. I... Um, I did that for like five years. And then the last job I got, I took a tanker from San Pedro to Boston. So it was oh. like through the Panama Canal along the Gulf Coast. It, it took about three weeks. And at the end of that three weeks, I was just so completely over it in a way that I had <laughs> never been on a ship before. I was just like, this is, a, you know, sometimes you just realize when the vine you're swinging on has reached its apex you like, say, I don't the, know. the ship has sailed, man. The ship <laughs> has sailed on my sailing career. So I just, I, I let, I let go of that vine. I was like, you know what? If, if you lean forward, the direction will appear if, mm -hmm. if you do it with intention. So after that, I moved to LA. I started doing um, PA work, production assistant work okay. on student films and really low budget movies and music videos and so, just so to get on set. Of, yeah, behind, behind the scenes a little bit, but behind did you have scenes, any yeah. acting background or, or how, how did you kind of hone your never, craft? So to never. Speak? I had never, before I moved to Los Angeles, I had never been on stage in my life. I wasn't the high school drama guy. I'd never done stand-up, improv. I had no experience at all. I knew I wanted it, and I knew I had, like, the capacity for it. But I, there's, uh, there's kind of the, I guess, raw talent, and then there's there's training and learning how to do it. So the intro to me was doing the production assistant work and getting your foot in the door because you could actually see professional actors or even like aspiring actors work on their thing. And at the same time, while you're learning their job and your job, the you're at the bottom rung oh uh, you know what i mean so it's just like yeah i empty that trash can i can do it you know yes, you're yeah you're not expected to know a lot of things because i mean i'm working for free uh, for this usc student film how much you know how much expertise do you yeah. are you expecting from me yeah so um i just kind of did that and I, I always say like the entertainment was the gig economy before it was the gig economy for everybody. You just job, job, well job, yeah, job, the, job, 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 the kind of main industries followed in a way. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause if you want stability <laughs> or right. like, you know, benefits, it's, it's not the industry for you. So yeah. you, you were working as a production ass assistant, assistant, kind of learning the craft, so to speak, mm -hmm. then you didn't stay there. What, what were some of the next steps? 
Well, the next step for me, and I'll, I'll just add this before we move too far away from it. Please so do. I, I actually, I'm currently um, studying business at Santa Monica College because I never went to college. So I was just like, well, what the, what the hell? Yeah. So, uh, you know, and it's kind of like this intro to business thing. But it, what really made me laugh, which is so, um, so true of anyone in the arts uh, it said that the most successful entrepreneurs and it like listed, you know, an, a number of attributes that make good entrepreneurs. And the two of them that stood out to me was they need to be self-directed and they need to have a high tolerance for uncertainty. Hmm. And I was just like, self-directed <laughs> high tolerance for uncertainty. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like us. So um, I did production assistant work for uh, a lot of years through that, I met someone who was a boom operator and um, he, you know, he's like, hey, if you ever want to get into this, I, I'd be happy to introduce you. Some people kind of show you the ropes. Boom operator, for uh, your listeners that don't know, is the guy who's or the person who's literally holding the microphone above actors' heads while they're acting. That's the good way to operator. build shoulders, too. Right. Yeah, exactly. So um, I transitioned out of doing production. Uh, assistant work and became a boom operator but at the same time i was you know taking classes on the weekends and doing open mics and stand up at night and so it was always that kind of like hodgepodge of, of yeah, everything what, what was kind of your motivation for acting and stand up at the same time yeah um i just i i had always wanted to basically do it since i was nine or ten years old you know and, and when you say it like because some people do stand up to enhance their acting mm -hmm. and some stand-ups they just want to get on tv so they can mm -hmm. sell more tickets what <laughs> where were you at um i was at the point where especially when i first uh, arrived in los angeles i had no performing experience at all you know so i couldn't arrive and just say i'm a actor <laughs> or you know i'm a stand-up i did I did all of them and I still do all of them. Um, you know, acting, I do stand up, I'm in an improv troupe that we have, we do monthly shows, I write, I direct. It's like there's no reason that you can't do every idea that you have within, you know, within reason. So that was kind of the 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 impetus. It's just like there's no one telling me not to. Sometimes stand-ups would be like, oh, you can't act or you can't do improv or you can't you know it's just like let her rip you know, what, her rip. what what have you got to lose absolutely nothing and i do think all the disciplines um really f feed and inform each other you know i i made an effort to um to put it out to the comedy community especially stand-ups hey if you have a self-tape for um for an audition or you want to run lines or if you ever want to talk about a character or just uh talk on the phone or hang out or get a coffee hit me up i will do it with you for free forever mm -hmm. because I think especially stand-ups, they're like, oh, I'm just a comedian and, you know, I, I don't know how to act. But they have such a leg up on other actors because they're they're on stage every night, yeah. you know, being themselves, whatever persona they've developed, they wrote all their material, like, you know, they're themselves. But when you're acting, for the most part, especially on something like a television show or a commercial. They're like, hey, be yourself in this. Yeah. And they literally give you the lines to say. You just have to kind of do your do your thing. You have to do your thing. Well, well, your your thing is taking you to some, some cool places. I, you've you've oh, thanks, been, man. On, been on Conan. You've had multiple stand-up specials. You've, you've been on uh, – your dry bar one's great. Check it out. Um, thanks, man. You've, you've performed at the White House, uh, at the Red Rock Show, Back in the day, what you know, um, I guess you know, what are you most proud of when it when it comes to your your stand up career? Why that's a great question. Um, I don't know if if it if it's pride, but I do remember a very specific moment that kind of informed my you know my my uh, take on it. Uh, I was very, very early. I did this show in Santa Barbara, and um, 
it was the 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 stand up the the microphone was a karaoke machine okay and i remember doing it and it was at some sushi restaurant uh-huh. and i remember going and doing um like 15 to 20 minutes of like clean family friendly comedy mm-hmm. and it just it couldn't have gone better and i was i think i may have been doing it for like 3 or 4 years and i remember seeing a uh, a dad and like his 12 year old son leaving together and they were smiling and they were like, kind of like laughing. And the dad had his arm around his kid's shoulder and they had a moment that they enjoyed together. And it was because of what I had done, you know, because of the things that we shared. And um, it really made me want to have that kind of experience with, with more and more people. It's it's addictive, but I think in a good way. And I, I remember when your um, Conan set came out, uh, you and I were talking before that. Like I think it was a cool story, which I, I think it's an important lesson for not for not just stand ups, but for you know other people who are entrepreneurial or want to deal with uncertainty. Can you kind of give the backstory of, of how you landed the Conan gig? Well, um, to, before I was on Conan, that would that set was five years in the making. Before I got on uh, his his show, uh, I had initially uh, been uh, approached, and they had seen me when Conan was first on uh, the Tonight Show. When he inherited the Tonight Show, uh, they started to roll out people, and I, JP Buck was his uh, was his producer, which was also for his uh, his TBS show. So he went out and um, he saw me there. We were in the works putting the set together. Then the whole Conan thing happened. <laughs> and then there was a year where he was legally prohibited from being on TV. You remember that? Yeah, he like had no show at all because yeah. he was like, okay, well, we'll let you back in a year. Uh-huh. So um, so a- a- after it was all said and done, uh, I probably showcased live for JP over the next two years, five, six times you know and then ultimately he's just we put the set together we collaborated on it and he's like yeah here this is this is it let's lock it in and what i didn't know is jp is not only the producer of the stand-ups but he's also uh, something of the segment producer for conan so conan has no uh, input or influence on the stand-ups uh, the first and only time he ever sees them is when he's sitting on the desk and they're on their mark and he introduces them and just kind of sits back and is like, all right, here he is. He doesn't know what you're going to say or what you're going to do. And um, the reaction that he had after my set, he walked up to me and just was so gracious and so complimentary. Uh, it was one of the uh, that's another highlight of my life, too. You know, when you're just getting praise from someone you respect so much. Well, it, yeah, you praise from someone you respect so much. And it was a result of not only the, the five years of, of kind of dedicated practice for that specific opportunity, however many years led up, you know, the, the, the shows in Santa Barbara, the shows at Red Rock, the shows, you know, Santa Monica, you know, it, it, it all yeah. it all adds up. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you shared that because. I, I had sent in some stand-up work recently for for I'm not going to name the name of the show, but it's a it's a major television show. Cool. And it was like it's been like a few days. I'm like I have not heard back. <laughs> what, <you know? laughs> like, I'm so pissed. But it's just yeah. Sometimes it takes. You know, yeah, I think there's another uh, another element just for the the community and for your listeners to understand. There's a certain pragmatism that you need to have, wherein it's like I went to. Um, uh, uh, hear a casting director speak recently, and, and she was saying that they routinely see for one role for every show, they see 25 people mm-hmm. or more, you yeah. know, for like a commercial, it could be 75, 100, 200. So if every time you didn't get one, you're like, oh, I knew I wasn't good enough. It's just <laughs> like, well, it's also, you know, if your doctor said you had a one in 25 chance of living, you wouldn't be like, yeah, you were just like, okay, well, I, I get it. You know, I think there's a certain um, at point at which you just realize, like, look, this is the best I can do. 
I'm giving you the best I can do. And if you can deliver that and walk away, it's not always easy, but at the very least you have that empowerment of like, uh, because even like, I would say a majority of the TV shows I've been on, I've never gotten any direction from the director. I just (laughs) did exactly what I did at the audition because they're booking you, but they're also booking your idea. They're like, hey, this is your take on it. Come do your take on it. You're not well, going to get a you know redirection or much of it. It's more efficient that way. You know, I mean, if they had to give you notes every thirty seconds, it's going to go over time. Budget's going to balloon. You know, you probably won't get hired. Yeah, but, just show up and uh, um, st- stay out of the way until it's time to you know time to get in there. Time, but yeah, I could say uh, on one hand, I can count the number of uh, direction I got from a TV director. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of fingers or he's just good at, you know, <laughs> being tripped. <laughs> no, on, on, on the, uh, he, he only has five fingers, folks, but, but he uses those five fingers to, to work hard. And you mentioned moments ago, Matt, you know, for a commercial, you're, you're one of 25, maybe one of a hundred, yeah. um, not terribly long ago, you, you booked a, something that's, uh, quite noteworthy uh the show is called shrinking um take us that like uh, obviously now it's it's an amazing show and i'm not just saying that because you're on the podcast but thanks for, Matt. for our listeners let like take us through like the audition process and and, and when you found out you got the gig well uh, it, in all humility it was just one of you know many things that i just recorded on my iPhone and I emailed it in and I didn't, you know, I was excited because it's just like oh, Harrison Ford's in this show, you know, eh. and, but I didn't, I, it wasn't like um, I was waiting or expecting anything. Uh, but they just kind of reached out a week later and they're like, yeah, um, you're the guy come, you know, come on in and, and, and do the thing. So I wish I had like this big, you know, so I was sitting there and then, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, Bill Lawrence my saw me. Called, yeah. like, my agent called, he's like, Knutes, you're in. Knutes. Uh, there was some, uh, there were some other factors in play. I don't know if it, if how much it contributed to it, but Bill Lawrence follows me on Twitter. And, uh, it, you know, I think he follows like six or 700 people. And for whatever reason, I'm one of them. He's responded to some jokes I put out there and, you know, uh, uh, photos and things like that. Um, the director of that episode, James Ponsolt, uh, we have a mutual friend in common. They're both from Georgia. So anytime the Braves are in town, uh, oh, the, yeah, the Dodgers and the Braves will go to a game. So I've been to a few games with James. But even with those connections, I wasn't like, here we go. It was just, it was, I, I've been telling everyone, and it's really true. It's just a good old fashioned lucky break. Well, yes. I, I think you're being a little bit modest because it, what is uh, John Wooden said, uh, luck is where skill and preparation intersect. And, yeah. and or no, in a preparation and opportunity. So mm-hmm. the opportunity might have been a chance, but it wasn't as if, you would never done an audition before. I mean, like, give us a timeline, Matt. Like, how how long had you been kind of grinding before this show? Yeah. Um, Well, I moved to Los Angeles in uh, 1998. So it was literally half my life. I've been doing this for half my life. And yeah, my joke is always like, I have yet to uh, hit it big, but I've hit it medium for a long time. (laughs) You know, the difference between uh, like shrinking and some other things I've been on. And I say this like also like kicking the dirt and shrugging. You know, I've been on uh, Key and Peele, Workaholics, Big Bang Theory, you know, like a lot of like these prestigious shows. But I've just been like a guest star where you show in for one episode and, you know, it's not really memorable. It's more niche show than shrinking uh i I think everyone just loves shrinking because the writing and directing and harrison ford is just so 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 funny in this so um it's a great cast and then i'm curious because you've like sean penn harrison ford jason siegel 
How do they not get starstruck around you, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. I'm, I'm actually, uh, one of the things I'm working on right now is I'm writing a book. And the name of the book is Have I Seen You in Anything? Uh, <laughs> true Stories from a Guy Who Seems Familiar. So it's like the character actor's version of 20 Feet from Stardom. Because I, I do have these stories with these people and it's just like, uh, but they're not, they're not, um, unless you're like the, 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 the co-star, people don't really think about it. But the idea for the book is like, it's not like a dishy tell all that, that like trashes people. It's exactly the opposite. It's like, Hey, um, do you like Brian Cranston now? Well, get a load of this because he's even cooler than you think. That's so, so it's nice. just yeah. stories that really pump people up. They're 100% true. But um, my pitch for the book is I want to throw people over the bus. Over Okay. Well, is there anyone that you, you know, obviously you're a pro, you're, you're a, a practice trained actor, but where oh, you're like nervous like oh this is sean penn or this is so you know who who was it that you were most like all right get it together i didn't talk to sean penn i didn't give him this space and I, I mean i gave him his space uh i was very nervous meeting president obama oh yeah you know when the white house he we had a moment we shook hands in the blue he's, room he's and famous you know, yeah. he's, he's pretty famous so but i also didn't want to um be too like oh you're the great you know i try and uh if i could go back and give myself advice when i was first coming up it would be just act like you've been there before act even like if you've been there before yeah even if it's um uh, just stay, remaining quiet. You don't need to go and fan off and let someone know that you like, you know, when you see James Kahn at the Playboy Mansion, they're just like, I love the Godfather. He's just like, dude, just leave him alone. He's like, I'm hitting on Miss February. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> True. So, um, I mean, there's been uh, so many, so many, you know, in, encounters that I've had in my life. And I think, you know, less, less is more. You know, what, the, what, one of the stories I just wrote is like working with Michael Douglas and Alan Arkin on the Kaminsky method. And um, if a star, if a star wants to talk to you, they're going to do it. You know, you don't need the, to they'll engage. figure a way to make it happen. Yeah. The biggest gift you can give to someone famous is just to leave them alone. Because I don't That's think you're going to hit somebody with it. Yeah. You're not going to hit someone with a line or something like, you know, yeah. I've got a, a movie. You're perfect for it because that line. Well, that that brings up a bit, an interesting point. Like you, you mentioned, you've been in LA for 25 years, and and you land this gig. Obviously, plenty in between, but just for sake of argument, Matt, say you got this shrinking job your first year. How do you think it would differ? You know, in, in terms of your appreciation or just your your outlook on it. That's a great question, Maddie. Um, I I don't know if it would have resonated in the same way as it does right now, just because I've been I've been a series regular a couple times before, but they were on things that were short lived and that they just that nobody watched. Uh, so I have been that uh, just kind of middle of the road working character actor, which is really what I am in this. I, I just mm -hmm. did a few episodes, but I was just the guy who, uh, if if people haven't seen it yet, or you 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 have seen it, the therapist that the, you know, there's like a twist at the top where you think Jason's in therapy, and then it's actually he's the therapist, and then we like spread my mom's ashes at the Rose Bowl. So yeah. those are like uh, I, it's not what I would consider like a star making turn but it's a character actor role this just happened to be in a show that's become this really incredible uh well it's sort of the new like iconic sitcom i mean i, I think we're never going to have the same water cooler days with like seinfeld or friends or cheers or somewhere where it's like there were three networks and right. most of america watched it but this this kind of is the new generation of sitcoms, although you can say you can cuss and, you know, it, it, right. it's, it's better. But I mean, you're on something that will be talked about for generations. I mean, I mean, like how, you know, how does that make you feel? 
it, it feels great. It just is really like a, a lucky break and a fun surprise. Uh, there's also another element too, where even, even if you've shot something and even if you've been a part of something, you don't know how they're going to use it. They could cut you out. They could, you know, I mean, I remember being in a movie and I was just like all excited that, you know, I got, I got invited to the premiere and I went and all my stuff was cut. <laughs> And I didn't know it. It, it, it. All the checks cleared and everything, but I didn't know it until I was like, <laughs> no one had the heart to tell. <laughs> and I was just like, you know, uh, so many things. Like I remember, I did a lie. Uh, 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 oh gosh, what was it? The Fosters. I did an episode of The Fosters, and they had um, they had somebody else like loop my lines. I guess they like they like changed. They didn't bring me back to like do my own ADR. They're like, "Hey, uh, Rick, you come over here to say what he said." I was like, "I mean, so to, to have that be the uh, you know to have this happen where I'm, uh, you know, at the at the elder part of my career, it's really really incredible, and I'm deeply grateful. And even if I wasn't part of the show, I would still love it because it's really super fun. Oh, it's it's a it's a great show. I, it's, I strongly recommend it. Even if Matt wasn't in it, I I, I would recommend it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and these think, were the glasses I just I mean I I'm wearing say, yeah they, they were they were my glass they were my glasses I wore them in the audition I just wore them on set I wear them all the time you know so well, it, it wasn't like anything one, new one theme is if you audition and get the part do whatever you did in the audition like don't don't mess with yeah. it yeah what, they're they're booking you and they're booking your idea right it's not time to change it after you got the job kids so to the hundreds of millions of people listening to this who are some are are aspiring actors um what pieces of advice or words of wisdom uh, do you want to impart to them that mm -hmm. um that's a great question too i would just say do your best and and help other people when you can and uh always be doing work that you're proud of i, I like that be doing work that you're proud of and on yeah. those lines, Matt, um, what are you most optimistic about? You know, the thing I'm really looking forward to um, is finishing my book and kind of getting out there, uh, doing some more stand-up, recording my next album, get another, uh, you know, get another album out there. I've also been doing something called the One Man Variety Show, which is I'm really excited to continue honing it. I've done it before, but it's, uh, it's stand-up, but it's also... Um, sketches and short films and I play music and I dance. So it's kind of like I'm, I'm pitching it as a combination of the Chappelle show meets Lawrence Welk. So I'd love to get that out there. Those are two and, demographic groups that I don't really, you yeah, know, put yeah. together lots of. So I'm trying to, at the very, at the very least, have something uh, like we were talking about before. Do something to do my best, and do something that I'm proud of, and do something that I'm excited about. Because the one man variety show, it's like it is an hour, but it's um, tw it's like twelve five minute bits. So you can kind of rearrange them and work them out, and um, you know, and on the personal side. My wife and I are celebrating our 20th wedding anniversary. Wow, so, that is the yeah. most un-Hollywood thing you can <laughs> do. And I'm very proud of you. And Thank he does you. have an amazing wife. Uh, I remember She's meeting great. her. I was like, oh, wow, good, good, good job. <laughs> One of a job, kind. Matt. Yeah, so for our, our gift to each other, we're, uh, we're going on the, uh, the Rocky Mountaineer, which is, uh, which is a, a, it goes through the Canadian Rockies. So you go round trip from uh, from Vancouver to Banff National Forest, and you go it's four days there and four days back, and we're just super duper excited. I, I can't think of a cooler twentieth anniversary present. Well, for for people out there who want to support you, want to learn more about you, maybe want to follow your quips where you know where can we direct these folks that you know i think the best place to find me is on the tree it's a link tree at matt knutes and that has a, a a link to my website uh all my socials uh all, all three albums on Bandcamp, uh the 
TikTok, uh, LinkedIn. I, I made a LinkedIn profile, Maddie. That's awesome. I'm on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. You're yeah, square. Uh, uh, the link to the Dry Bar Comedy Special. Um, I think there's like eight links on there. And we'll, we'll, so we'll include YouTube. your link tree in the, the description of the show. But Matt Knudsen, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Maddie. Longtime friend. Happy to be here. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Matt Balaker podcast. To learn more, please check out mattbalaker.com and encourage your friends to like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate it. Mm-hmm.